In this episode, I award Nami the Infected Badge. She's come down with the same flashback illness that infected Chopper in the last episode. Quick, quarantine her before they all fall victim! Welcome to the journey, welcome to the crew, we think we're pretty funny, and we hope that you will too. This is the opening song to season two. It's where the journey really starts because we've made it out of East Blue. We've got our snacks and we've got our friends. Now it's time to discuss the anime that never ends. Yeah! Start the show! Hello, fellow adventurers of the Grand Line, and welcome to episode 47 of King of the What Now. We are an anime review podcast specifically for the show One Piece. I'm your host, Joel, a longtime fan of the series, and I'm a completely 2D character who has no real gripping motivation because I'm only going to be here for a single filler episode. And I'm Curtis, the co-host, a One Piece novice, and also I'm a small child working with explosives. What could go wrong? (laughs) Yes, just remember to ask your dead parents as to whether or not you should be allowed to continue to play with the explosives. Yes, and when the stranger behind me pretends to be them, I'll listen to him and pretend that he's my parents. Hey, he can control the weather, okay? Uh, This is a very special episode for two (laughs) different reasons. Firstly... It's the very last episode of the Alabasta Saga. Season 2 of King of the What Now is... It's coming to an end, folks. It's been a really fun journey. So this will be about these specific episodes, but also the saga as a whole. Yeah, and uh, this is also the episode when Joel takes me out back. And uh, and let's just say he's going to have to get a new co-host. You know, today's sponsor might in fact be uh, uh, cyborgs that can, you know, make your friends better than what they are. And so, you know, I just think that a robot would better be able to remember all those tiny details. Hey, hey, what's that you got over there? I am Kurt Bot. I will be co-host after you. You already got a robot to replace me, Joel? <laughs> Why would I kill you before I'd have the, another replacement ready? Uh, that's the, that's how that works. Get out of here, Kurtbot. Okay, folks, that's that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of riffing. But I do need to take a moment from your regularly scheduled podcast to speak from the heart. And I would very much appreciate it if you could listen. I hope that this message is uh, short and to the point. So, let me just say that type 1 diabetes sucks. That is the only way that I can really put it. It's That's how the people of my generation would describe it, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, right? Uh, I was diagnosed when I was 6. I've had it for over 20 years, and, I mean, to be honest, almost every day is a struggle. So, when uh, Curtis and I started this podcast and we had Catherine support, uh, and then she eventually became a member of the team... Uh, I wanted, I was hoping that perhaps I would be able to have a platform where I'd be able to reach out to people for matters that are very important to me. So this year, and probably every year from now on, because it's a family tradition in, in my family, but we are going to be raising money for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, JDRF, and I will be participating, and I assume Curtis and Catherine are as well, in the 39th annual Nordstrom's Beat the Bridge event. Uh, what's important about that is that it's a 8K run or a 5K walk, and you can also uh, create a team and uh, take donations, and all that money goes to charity to help people with type 1 diabetes. If you are listening to this and you follow us on Twitter, I will tweet the link to the donation page directly. Uh, But also, if you wanted to go to your internet browser of choice and search JDRF uh, Beat the Bridge 2019, you'll be taken to a page and one of the top links should have a, should be Donate. And if you click Donate, you can search for a team. We are Joel's Brigade, J-O-E-L apostrophe S, B-R-I-G-A-D-E. And so just go to that page and you can donate to a particular racer or you can donate just to the team. And if you support us, uh, we would be very grateful if you don't have the money yourself, but you might know someone else who might be able to, to help. Be sure to spread the word, uh, send the link and that sort of thing. Uh, tell them about our message. Uh, this is very important to me. Uh, I love my anime pirates, but I love living a life that is not full of 
constant struggle. <laughs> so what's diabetes? Uh, it's when your pancreas, one of the lesser known organs, stops working or doesn't function properly. Type 1 diabetes is hereditary. There's nothing that I could have done to stave it off. Uh, now that I have it, it's, it's around forever, and my pancreas doesn't work at all. Can't produce something called insulin, which is part of your body's digestive process. When you eat sugar, that gets absorbed into the blood, and insulin's the anti-sugar that brings your blood sugar back down. I can't produce it. So I literally have a fake pancreas that's attached to my body at all times. I check my blood sugar before every single meal. Uh, I have to stay away from sweets and candies uh, for the most part. And uh, I have to wear a thing on my arm. It's a monitor that works in tandem with the the, uh, the blood sugar monitor. Uh, it prevents me from sometimes exercising. Uh, when I try to go for runs, I have to stop five minutes into what should have been a long run because my blood sugar is low. Uh, high blood sugar causes me to become incredibly uh, moody and cranky. And every time my blood sugar gets above a certain threshold, um, it causes damage to the capillaries, which are in your eyes, which are in your fingers, which are in your feet. And for men, it also affects the penis. And so it, it causes a lot of problems the damage is pretty much irreversible, and there is no cure. It affects millions of people, and so by donating to Joel's Brigade or just JDRF in general, you are supporting helping people get through it. I lived a pretty privileged life as a child. My family was was pretty well off, and they were able to support me, but that health insurance costs, they can, they can be a lot, and uh, it really sucks. From the, from the very bottom of my heart, I would not wish type 1 diabetes on anyone. So again, please feel free to donate or feel free to spread the message. I'm not going to keep bothering uh, our listeners with this message over and over again, but maybe once a month I'll just say, hey, reminder, we're doing the fundraiser, but it won't be this big, long spiel. We now return to your regularly scheduled episode, unless Curtis has something to say. Oh, I... no. Okay, Curtis does you not have with... type 1 diabetes. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> but it oh. seems like it sucks. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's no good. And back to the regularly scheduled Alabasta episodes. We just finished watching five episodes of the anime. Curtis, I think you took notes. My internet's not working. <laughs> yes, I did take notes. Um, to summarize all five episodes, Oda... Well, can you tell them what episode numbers? That's oh, what yeah. Was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Episodes 31, 32... 33, oh wait, I'm sorry, 131, <laughs> 132, 133, 134, and 135. Um, I don't have the names of the episodes, but those are the numbers. Um, in these five episodes, here's what Oda did. He made a nice big batch of beer. Okay. Right? And okay. then he watered it down, like half water. And then he charged us the same amount hmm. because he used a bunch of filler. <laughs> so that was a long walk it was a pretty good drink of water yeah it was mostly water because he, he mm -mm -mm -mm. cut cut the beer <laughs> also should it be beer or should it be sake i mean you could go sake too you but they do truly oh they do they drink beer there okay they have kirin and sapporo and uh what's the other one uh asahi ladies and gentlemen uh your host does not drink pretty much at all but yeah curtis is a social drinker and he's actually been to japan so take his word for it mm -hmm. don't take mine uh okay so, to here's the actual summaries. <laughs> Episode 131, there were fruit. There was fruit. There was water. And there were flashbacks, um, is what I wrote down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they go to an island. They collect food. And Chopper and Robin share, like, a little special afternoon together. Um, in, like, a not weird way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not in a romantic way. It's just... For this episode, they decided Chopper was not trusting Robin, and she is basically very nice to him, and he goes, oh, maybe she's not a monster mm -hmm. after all. Uh, 132 was... Oh, yeah, so they met a man from the Transponder Snail Mail Delivery Company. So it's basically a giant infomercial for crap. Yep. Um, and then we also learned a little... Or Nami was working on her map making, and then there was a storm... Um, episode 133, Sanji teaches a young child to cook curry on a marine ship. Um, that's basically all that happens in that episode. It's a lot of shots of cooking with almost no dialogue. Um, episode 134, Usopp pretends to be an angel and launches fireworks. So he goes, he, they go to an island that has having a firework festival. 
Um, which did you notice? They foreshadowed the fireworks in the same episode. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> um, but uh, it turns out the people who make the fireworks, they've been doing it for generations. And there's a small girl there and she's trying to recreate the dream of her parents who died trying to do it the year before the dream launch a very large firework. <laughs> um, and so Usopp helps figure out how to do it. Uh, and then episode 135 is all flashback. It's all Zor- how Zoro met uh, Johnny, Johnny and Yozaku, who I always want to call Johnny and Yanni. Um, <laughs> because, you know, that is a story that we were all really curious about. It's also it- the first, that is the origin story of Big Brother. That is true. Um yeah, and how did you feel about these episodes, Curtis? Some of them were okay. <laughs> Specifically, the firework one was actually somewhat amusing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was a good Usopp episode. Um, nah, for the most part, they were really bad. <laughs> like especially the cooking one. The cooking one was like it was so. The only interesting thing from that one was Sanji like was trying to give subtle hints to the kid mm, about, about how to cook and such. Yeah. yeah so he wasn't at, he he said, I don't want to help. I just want to look around your guys's marine kitchen. And he would like he did things so for example, the kid was cooking the food on too high of a temperature. And so he leans over to light his cigarette on the burner and he's like, oh look, I singed a hair. And then the kid's like, I wonder if the temperature is too high and he turned it down. <laughs> Uh, stuff like that, right? And so it's other than that, a lot of the episode was watching this kid cook curry, and it was not very interesting. Also, I love Japanese curry; it's not the most visually interesting food in the world. Nope. It, I mean, it was just like he was literally stirring a pot filled with brown sludge for yeah. part of it, and it's like that's what it looks like, and it's pretty tasty, but. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It was a, it was a strange set of episodes. Did you know that these five episodes are actually all part of the same arc? What's They're called the arc that you show people if you don't want them to like One Piece. Is that really what it's called? No, oh, it's okay. called the post Alabasta arc. But my gosh, yeah. I felt myself like physically drifting off to sleep during these episodes. And there was some interesting bits in it. But for the most part, like uh, Curtis said, I'm going to have to echo your your sentiments. Mm-hmm. Not great. I will say my favorite, the the fireworks one was pretty good. I will also kind of give the flashback episode with Zoro a pass because that's not something we'd already seen before. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nami is like, oh, I want to draw a map. Yeah, we know that, Nami. We, we we know that. We've seen that. You've said that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hey, I will say seeing early Zoro was interesting. Like he, so we know he trains a lot. Mm-hmm. We never thought about the fact that he's trained himself to be stronger than the equipment he uses. Mm. So he had to learn how to restrain himself. So the thing that kept happening is he has one sword. That's really good quality. That's the one that he got from, um, um, Koina, Koina. Thank you. Or to Shiggy or I don't know. Yeah. Um, and he had a couple other swords. He basically, he breaks all the other swords cause he's too strong for them. And so he's like, Oh, I need to restrain myself so I don't break my equipment. So it was kind of interesting seeing that, um, and then like I don't know, just seeing his early life as a pseudo bounty hunter. Uh, and apparently, he never once called himself bounty hunter. Is a piece of information that he mm-hmm. repeats. Or it's pirate hunter. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, either because he also says I'm not a bounty hunter. Mm-hmm. I just collect bounties, <laughs> but only for food. He needs to survive and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. So, and he was a pretty polite guy, you know. When he took, he accidentally quote-unquote, uh, took the prey from Johnny and, and Yosaku. I almost called them Yanni, too. Uh, <laughs> I've they, infected you. <laughs> they were sitting in the corner of a bar, at the bar, and there was a, a pirate with a high bounty there. And they kept going, any minute now, we're going to get up and we're going to fight that guy. We're going to take him down any minute now. And Zoro comes in and beats the guy and... You know, he's going to take the bounty. And they go, you took him from us. So Zoro goes, here, have the entire bounty. Just pay for my meal. Yeah, just pay for my meal because he bought lunch, ba- assuming that he was going to keep the bounty. Mm. I so. Zoro, for me, is very, he's he fits that stereotype for, like, a warrior mm-hmm. in, a, in, like, I don't know if this is a Japanese culture thing, but at least an anime. Uh-huh. Um, where 
you don't really care that much about worldly possessions or fame, but you care a lot about honor. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, I just want to become stronger. And, you know, I, okay, you guys can have the money. I don't really need it. Just pay for my meal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Make sure I'm squared up. Yeah. It's very much so the, the, uh, is Bushido, the code of the Bushido, uh, which is, uh, samurai stuff, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, Zoro has the most traditionally Japanese, Outlook, not outlook on life, but kind of um, theme to his character and, yeah. and the way that he thinks and talks and stuff. And Oda said, if these characters lived in the real world, where would they actually live or where would they be from? And Zoro is Japan. That's mm-hmm. No surprise. Yeah. But, Sanji was probably France. Uh, I can't remember. Somewhere I know, in Europe. Yeah. And I think uh, um, uh, Luffy, I think, was Brazil. That's like the only oh. other one that I remember. Yeah, I could see him being Brazilian. <laughs> um, hmm, okay. Uh, Chopper, somewhere up north. <laughs> somewhere where it's cold? I mean, very well could be. <laughs> Chopper, he's from the Sahara Desert. <laughs> okay. Uh, what else about these episodes? Anything else that stands out to you? <sighs> Again. Well, I think about these episodes... Uh, I wonder if our sponsor today would have something to help us through it. Uh, you know what? It's kind of tangentially related. I could see how you how your brain would kind of associate it. As we know, the snake overlords have forbidden any kind of time anomalies. This could lead to problems with changing the past, for example, and that's strictly forbidden. It could unravel the very universe. So you, we're all mandated as citizens under the rule of the snake commanders to be vigilant against these time anomalies. But this company has figured out that just because you have to have a product doesn't mean that you have to settle for the lowest quality product. So what they're bringing to you today are time sensors and time locks, specially designed uh, state-of-the-art technology that can allow you to safeguard yourself from any temporal anal- anomalies. They're small, uh, compact, they're user-friendly, and they come in wonderful colors that can be completely customized. I'm I'm actually a big fan of the uh, tangerine-colored one. Mm, Interesting, interesting. Okay. I've heard that you can uh, get, like, special attachments and mods and stuff. So, like, I have one that uh, also has, like, a little tiny fan on it, so it keeps me cool when it's hot out. And uh, mine also happens to smell like strawberries, you know? Oh, that's nice. Um, I didn't want the strawberry one but they were out of the one that smelled like what i really wanted so what was that uh that was freshly baked chicken nuggets oh that's a very specific one joel (laughs) i was so happy when i realized that there was finally someone out there who enjoyed the smell but it sold out immediately because i guess i'm not the only one so uh, did were you going for the freshly baked normal shaped chicken nuggets or the freshly baked dinosaur shaped chicken nuggets (laughs) because that's a completely different smell (laughs) see i would disagree i think they have the same smell but uh if Catherine were here unfortunately she's still doing ghostly business in the other world but uh, she would say that the dinosaur-shaped nuggets taste much better, and her theory is that it's the number of edges, more uh, surface area to get crispy. Mm, okay. Yes. Uh, but no, let's let's uh, talk about these time anomalies. Have you noticed anything strange going on in your house? Have you suddenly like looked around and realized you just lost five minutes of your life? Uh, yeah, everyone. You know, it actually happens to me uh, every night. Interesting. I, yeah, I... I I lay down in my bed to, you know, stare at the ceiling for several hours. I close my eyes and then I open up and it's morning. It's like I just lost like, you know, anywhere between six to nine hours. That's incredible. And with this new technology, you can eliminate that. You can solve the problem. There's a nice little diagnostic tool. You can see reports of if other people in the area are seeing the same thing as you do. Because as we all know... Uh, temporal anomalies start in a specific point and they ripple outward. So mm-hmm. you might be at the very edge or you might be at the very center. And by correlating all the data between all the different people, by aggregating it, we'll get a clearer picture. And together, we can keep society safe for the snake overlords. And now, we're going to go back to our regularly scheduled episodes. Welcome back to this filler episode of King of the What Now. Uh, <laughs> we try to fill time talking about filler episodes that didn't have much content. Okay, so there was a kid in Zoro's episode, mm-hmm. the one who tried to stand up to Dick. 
the bandit. <laughs> that and, was his name, dude. That was his just, name. Just so people know, Joel's not making a joke now. The guy's name was Dick. It was. <laughs> so there was a kid uh, who tried to protect the, the crops or something from the bad pirate man. Yeah, they were trying to take their, their crop stores. <laughs> there was. <laughs> I don't know why that's so funny. There was a kid trying to set off the fireworks who tried to talk to uh, their mommy and daddy who Usopp pretended to be those parents. That's interesting. There was the chef who wanted to cook some stuff. Uh, Nami's episode didn't have any children other than Nami as a child in the flashback. And what was the first one? Chopper was also Chopper was a child. So we have three children characters. Which one did you find the most endearing? Four. Four children characters. What? Four. Who's the fourth one? What we had? Little Chopper? No, Chopper doesn't count. Oh, okay. We're not counting Chopper in a three. filler characters. Three. Okay, uh, clearly the explosives girl, whose name I've forgotten. <laughs> uh, she was, oh no, I wrote down. She, <laughs> she was, he was oh, no. no, he was Odama. Yeah. Odama was the, the, the Grandpa, grandfather. and she was Kodama. Oh, that's right. She was Kodama, the exploder. <laughs> uh, yeah, she had some pretty good interactions with Usopp. She felt the most childlike in the way that children sometimes act like they know everything, but then they also kind of seem to not, anyways... Yeah, and I mean, I don't know. She felt like the most like a real character. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. With she was more fleshed out. The kid yes. was like, "I ruined this meal, and I don't know how to cook." And then he's like, "I remembered how to cook from the lessons that I learned by washing dishes." Oh my gosh! <laughs> and then oh, I was just gonna say, and then the, the the other kid is like, "Don't take our crops," and he just charges at the big man, and yep. that's about it. He helps Zoro by throwing a bucket of water at the guy after being uh. told that. Oh. Okay, so the, the this guy must be made out of sand. Let's put water on him. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. That was actually foreshadowing for how to defeat crocodiles. Yeah, but Zoro if, didn't. Yeah, Zoro wasn't paying attention. <laughs> he didn't. Can we just talk about this for a second? So this this kid falls off a marine ship onto the going merry. So so we're back to the chef. We're back to the chef kid, and he so he ends up falling onto the ship, and. It turns out that he has been working as a chef for the last six months, but he hasn't been allowed to cook anything. And Sanji says, I wasn't allowed to cook anything for six months. And do you know why that is? And the kid goes, oh, it's because you can't learn cooking. You have to observe it from other people around you. And there are several flashbacks of the guy who's supposedly, quote unquote, unable to teach people how to cook teaching other people how to cook but the kid happens to overhear it and i just mm, filler doesn't filler is allowed to be lousy and we go yeah that's that's kind of that's what filler is it, it does that but that is just stupid on every level yeah no i agree it's, it's yeah it's especially just, because on top of that sanji also helps teach him how to cook and also how did sanji learn how to cook he was taught yeah exactly. it's, it's like what are you talking about sanji <laughs> heck you just got a bunch of new recipes mm-hmm, from mm-hmm. what's her face uh you Yosa- no, not Yosa- <laughs> Yosa- 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 that's someone else um, hang on um, rice rice is the name of the infomercial person oh uh, no so it's it's uh igram's wife cochette or something like that no it was another so it was a name i recognized Kogata? it was like no she was named after a place i don't i don't know we are going to, let's move on. Okay. Uh, but yeah, he, he got new recipes, which is specifically him learning from another person. Yes. Uh, I think I can see maybe what they meant more like, um, learn for, learn through doing. Yeah. Like the more you experiment with your cooking, the more you can come up with stuff. But for a beginner to make a curry, like he'd been taught, just do it the way they'd shown you. They hadn't shown him, but still. Yeah. Oh my gosh. They hadn't shown him. <laughs> I will say that was one of my favorite. Some of these episodes were very specific to one character, but some of them kind of had multiple kind of like mini stories that involved different characters, or maybe you'll see someone doing something in the background. The episode with Sanji and the kid had my favorite Luffy moment because Luffy comes with them onto the ship because they need to use his stretchy powers. And he goes, how are you going to get back Sanji? And Sanji goes, sit, sit tight. Don't get into trouble, which is an immediate red flag that anyone would ever tell Luffy to sit still. And just Luffy running around being an idiot. Yeah, I really like that, actually. Mm-hmm. 
he tries to take some apples by smuggling them in his pants. And so he's like, I want those pants apples back. Uh, oh, my God. The kid used apples. And the he curry. Mm-hmm. So all of those, all of those uh, marine <laughs> marine officers who ate that curry, they might have gotten a little bit of Luffy pants sweat. Wow, that's pretty gross. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, these I literally felt like these episodes were a trial and a tribulation to get through. Do you have any final thoughts on these episodes? Uh, yeah, you mentioned this earlier, uh, so this will be our final thought. Um, all or these episodes. Then we'll talk about the saga in general. Oh. Really uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, for these episodes still. I mean, it's kind of tied to the saga, but um, <laughs> it's tied to the show. You mentioned the fact that so far, every crew member, including mm. Robin, their dream was something they came up with as a child. Absolutely. And the thing that caused me to realize that was, A, the flashbacks from the first two episodes showing Straw Hat crews as children, but then also the fact that all these... Uh, what am I... All of these filler episodes had children in it, and we made the joke that every One Piece movie has a child character, and so I started to stroke my chin, and I realized that maybe that's part of the idea is that children have these big dreams, and then when you get into adulthood, you're you're taught to, like, give up on them, I guess? But, you know, I think Oda's making the point that, no, dream big and follow them. So, Curtis, uh, any thoughts on children and dreams and such? Uh, no, I, th- I thought that was a very good point. Um, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking, too. Uh, I, I agree. I think that's what Oda's going for, especially considering that, from what you've told me, Oda's idea for One Piece started when he was a kid. Yes. So he is fulfilling his dream from when he was a child. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, that's not necessarily realistic for most people, but I get his point. Like, you know, it, it's it's supposed to be inspirational. Mm-hmm. Um. I will be curious to see what the dreams of the other Straw Hat crew members might be. Oh, you think that there might be more Straw Hat crew members? We we have seven so far, and while seven is a number that recurs over and over right now, we've got we've got the seven, seven warlords. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, six warlords now. Uh, oh yeah. Um, and seven seven uh, days of the week, the the, <laughs> the people. Mm-hmm. Usopp mentioned angels, which, of course, as we know, is also associated with the number seven. So that's, you know. Oh, seven heaven thing or something. Let's I just don't move know. on. Um, but yeah, so. OK, so that's pretty interesting. OK, but you think that seven's not quite there for the number of crewmates. Yes. OK. Something something tells me that there will be more than seven. Interesting. Uh, Luffy did say that he wanted 10 crew members before he went to the Grand Line. And so, you also, know. Also, a musician. He got a do- he he placed musician above doctor. I think he actually placed him he might have placed him above chef. A uh, musician was first above everything. Yeah. Like I think that was the only crew member position he mentioned until specifically he mentioned doctors and chefs right before they found Sanji and Chopper. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Okay, yeah, so uh, maybe there'll be three more members showing up, or maybe there'll be only, you know, maybe there'll be six more members. Mm-hmm. Who knows? I, I think, I think, let's say there are three more, right? Okay. We're going to have a musician, because we need a musician, because Luffy wants a musician. Okay. I think one of them is going to be a hacker. All right. For the many computer systems that they might run into. <laughs> okay. The last one? Yeah. Is um, going to be a fish man. A fish man. Fish man. So we can get them fish from underwater. Okay. So okay, they have a constant perfect. supply of fish. So they don't have to rely on their poor fishing skills. Mm-hmm. And they, the crew also has three devil fruit members on it currently. And so a fish man would be particularly useful because they would be able to uh, save Luffy or Chopper or Robin if mm-hmm. they happen to fall into the ocean. I forgot that Chopper was a was a devil fruit user. <laughs> He's a talking reindeer, Curtis. Those don't occur naturally. I know. Uh, okay, so uh, you think that there will be more crew members. You just called your shot on what profession or what they'll do. I like that the fishman's profession is just fishman. <laughs> <laughs> the the f- fishman's profession is fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cruel. That's their own people. <laughs> no, fishman is their people. Fish are just true. that's like chickens, like or like you know any other above water creature, right? Okay, like we, we eat saying. them. We eat cows. They're mammals. They're fellow mammals. At the same time, we had Hachi the octopus fish man and Arlong the sod nosed shark fish man and the manta ray fish man. So they clearly have the characteristics of other animals under the sea. So it would be like if there was 
species of dog that had human faces and a species of cat that had, I don't know, <laughs> speech or something. Mm. <laughs> I but, mean, there are some societies that eat monkey brains. Okay, that's true. And they are quite close to us in, in physiology mm-hmm. and stuff. Okay, that's that's fair. And also cannibals. That's true. <laughs> Let's not legitimize cannibalism. <laughs> yes, there are things, there are people that do that, but... Okay, so we need more crew members, as we've discussed, and do yes. you think that they will all also carry uh, childhood dreams with them? Do you think the pattern will continue? I think so. Okay. I think I think the musician's childhood dream will be to learn every instrument. Oh, okay. Sure. The the, um, the the hacker's childhood dream will to be will be to invent computers so they can <laughs> hack into them. No, I think that they want to be able to build a fully automated AI system. They want to invent or cause the singularity. I'm mm-hmm. not sure which term you would use. I think cause. Cause, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then and then the last one, the fisherman, the fishman fisherman. Mm-hmm. Uh, his... He wants to catch a fish this big. Yes. That clearly has to be it. Yeah, no. He's got to have the biggest fish tail. <laughs> okay. Now, you brought up another interesting point that I find very interesting. <laughs> I, yes. You brought up a very interesting point that I find fascinating. And you brought up a fascinating point that I find actually kind of meh. No, uh, you said that there are now only six warlords of the sea. We saw a Crocodile being told to turn in his badge, kind of the equivalent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and his devil fruit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think there's an extraction process? Do you think you can take like a powerful enough vacuum and like put it on their belly button and just floop? Yeah, <laughs> the fruit comes out, uh, which would make someone who doesn't have a belly button the perfect tool. Uh, no, but do you think the numbers of the warlords are going to slowly get whittled, or do you think that the world government is going to try and replenish uh, the the missing numbers? They might. Think- they might try to replenish it. I feel like okay. that's the sort of thing where you're like, we want to have seven. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. as they as they get knocked off, another one comes up. Okay. Do you think that anyone we've seen could fulfill that position? Like, do you think uh, Don Krieg has upped his game and become so notorious that he will be allowed to become a warlord? Buggy. Buggy? Buggy, the warlord of the sea. Interesting. Buggy, the immortal warlord of the sea. Okay, so Buggy the Immortal will show up, and do you think he'll use that power to pursue Straw Hat Luffy, his sworn enemy, the the man who defeated and humiliated him? Yeah, and also is humiliating humiliating the world government too. Oh, okay, yeah, that's perfect. So they're they're enemies of my enemies sort of situation. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Okay, uh, do you think they hold tryouts for the Seven Warlords, or do you think that they have like a, a backfill? You know, in case any of the Seven Warlords get defeated, I uh, they probably have to find a new one every time. Okay, my I mean, I mean, they probably have like an idea of like this would be a good candidate, or like mm-hmm. we have we have our eye on this one. <laughs> well, and here's another thing. Uh, I'm not going to say whether this is a thing or not. I could see it being a thing in One Piece or a similar anime. Maybe each of the seven warlords fulfills a specific role. I don't know what those roles would be for. Well, like, Mihawks would be swordsmen. So if anyone, any pirate shows up who can wield a sword, send Mihawk after them. So if Mihawk somehow gets defeated, maybe they'll try to find the next best swordsman pirate and be like, you want to join the sh- the Shichibukai, the seven warlords? Mm-hmm. They were going to say, like, you want to join join the the shitty group? <laughs> <laughs> we know that you're used to a lot of power. How would you like to have significantly less power and work for the government? Okay. There's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot of paperwork, and uh, you actually don't get that many sick days. I, I'm sorry, it's a 24/7, 365 days a year uh, sort of sort of job. Uh, okay. One other question. That I should have brought up last episode, and I'm kicking myself for not mentioning it. As Vivi was saying goodbye to them, she asked them, if we meet again, no matter how long it's been, will you still call me friend? And they did the big emotional scene with the X's on their arms. Something that we didn't talk about at length was the scene with the X on their arms with the Straw Hats as they were departing and as Vivi was calling out to them. Firstly... How did you like the scene with the X and the the goodbye to Vivi sort of thing? Um, you know, I'm not sure how the X-Men feel about it. 
All right. Chris. Okay. Serious answer. Yes, uh, okay. Um, I mean, it was, it was, I thought it was interesting. It's all, it's significant. Um, I don't know that it hit me emotionally, but it was, you know, it's like, Oh, that was cool. <laughs> um, I liked the fact that, uh, I was worried that when Nami shut Luffy up, because Vivi was like, will you always be my friend? And Luffy was about to yell back, but Nami was like, you can't yell because then the, the Marines, Marines will hear. Mm-hmm. Um, so then the, they did, I was happy they came up with a way to respond non-verbally in a way that she would understand, but would be cryptic to anybody else. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you would think that after traveling together on the crew and seeing what kind of person Luffy and the rest of the Star Hats are, you think that Vivi would be able to to know that they would still be her friend, even if they were pirates and she was a princess or whatever. But I am also glad that they didn't just ghost her. <laughs> just they all turn their back on her and sail away. And she goes, I thought we were friends. And then she hunts them down hmm. and kills them all. I do got to say the X on the back of the arm thing has been widely accepted as one of the most important scenes in all of one piece. Okay. Cause it, for the right people, it emotionally struck them. And it was, it's a pretty cool scene, even if you and I sometimes are kind of a little off on the emotional spectrum and stuff. Well, no, I, I get the significance of it. That's it's true. just like, I found the end of the Luffy and Crocodile fight much more, more impactful. Cathartic. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it's kind of different. One is I'm punching a, a bastard man, and one of them is, uh, you know, we're saying goodbye to a friend. So it's different uh, emotional notes. Mm-hmm. Here's another question. Is Vivi a member of the Straw Hats? There are no wrong answers. Well, if she is, then I'm either going to have to get rid of the musician, the hacker, or the fishman fisherman. Do you think that Vivi could have dormant fisherman blood in her <gasps> and suddenly transform? Or she could be the hacker. It could be an ancient alabasta technique. Oh, okay. That's what the pony glyph is. It's actually a, an encrypted file. Yeah. And Robin can mentally... So she, like, dropped the seed for the information yes. there. <laughs> um, okay, serious answer to your question. Uh, I don't... I don't think of her that way. I think of her as a as a similar status to Bon Clay, a friend of the Straw Hat crew. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, a better friend than Bon Clay, but <laughs> still, like, not an actual crew member. Mm-hmm. So she was a someone they helped out, and she rode along with them, but she doesn't have a position or role on the crew. That question... <sighs> does... It... <sighs> it's up for debate let me say that uh there are many people who will say she traveled on the ship with them and she fought alongside them and she even asked if they would still consider her her friend and the word friend sometimes means crewmate so that's the arguments kind of for why she is a a straw hat member there are other people who say she doesn't really have a dream other than protect my country uh, there are some who say because she stayed behind, she was given the choice, do you want to become a pirate? That because she said no, that she wasn't. Uh, and so, I don't know. She's definitely coming back. I think you and I can agree that she mm-hmm. played too significant a role. And that, if I come back later, that just reeks of foreshadowing. Yeah. Uh, but whether or not she officially counts, I think if you ask Luffy, he would say that she counts and Bon Clay doesn't. But that might just be... Because of the amount of time that they spent with Vivi versus the amount of time mm-hmm. that they spent with anyone else that they call friend. Johnny and Yosaku technically wrote on the straw hat ship for on the Going Mary for exactly half of an episode. So, you know, that's something. Yeah, and they fought alongside them. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I actually they might not have fought. They might have just spectated. They tried to fight Arlong. Okay. But it wasn't shown on screen, which is why I forgive you for not remembering. But yeah. they said, we tried to fight Arlong. He took us out in like a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. If Vivi comes back, and I mean, obviously they left her on Alabasta. So if she meets up with them, some time will have passed. She will have had, I don't know how to say this. They, they will have, ha- she will have had time to internalize what they taught her and possibly, I don't know, train with, say, Pell or Igaram or learn from reading more books. Or maybe Koza has some secret techniques he could show her. If she shows up, what do you want her to do? Do you want her to show up in a diplomatic sense, like as a member of the world government working within the world government? Do you want her to, 
uh, show up and suddenly be a badass fighter? What's going on? I think it'd be interesting if she is now working in the world government and trying to use her influence to help the Straw Hats. Mm, mm -hmm, Like, mm -hmm. trying to push that they get some sort of special status, um, maybe make Luffy a warlord of the sea or something (laughs) like that. Or, um, I don't know, something like that. Okay, fair enough. Here's a question. What if they offered Luffy to become a warlord of the sea? What do you think would happen? I think he'd probably turn it down, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't think he would accept it. I think in his mind, like, I'm going to become, you know, king of the pirates, and I'm not interested in someone else telling me what to do. And Mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, like, he will accept people. He will let people join his crew, and he will let people help him along the way. But I don't think he want. He's not interested in getting like another rank or position. Yes, absolutely. We will get more information about this. But the title and position and uh, the privilege of being a Shichibukai, a Seven Warlord, a Warlord of the Sea, comes with certain restrictions and benefits. And there are some very good reasons why someone would want to become a Warlord of the Sea. But there's a drawback in that you have to do what the government says. If you violate the rules, you lose your status, as like what happened with Crocodile. And I don't think anyone officially ever asks Luffy to become a Warlord mm-hmm. of the Sea, but he's too much of a wild card. They would not consider him for the position, yeah. and even if they were desperate, he would be like, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, wor- the world government would never offer it to him nope. at this point. Like, they've already, he's, he's burned any bridges that he's ever he would have had with the world government at this point oh man that technically means that crocodile is more of a yes man than luffy like he played quote unquote by the rules enough that he was offered a position and they were willing to let him in yeah but i think it it's it was all deception right so that's true that's true it's like you know trying to get an inside man for like a uh, burglary or something <laughs> like that so okay whoa crocodile is basically kuro 2.0 I, I, I don't know. He just, he played a certain role in order to get uh, along to a particular point. Oh, yeah, basically. Mm-hmm. Okay. And now we come to the final question before our final thoughts. Or maybe it's both, you know? Alabasta as a saga. Let's lump all of that story into one easily digestible bite. Okay, real quick. Did, did it technically start with Reverse Mountain? Or did yes. it start with The Whale? Or did it start with Whiskey Peak? I think it technically started with Reverse Mountain. Leading into the whale, that's right. Yes. Because there's one episode that ends with them going up uh, Reverse Mountain, and then the, and like starting to go down, and then the next episode picks up, so that's probably the cutover point. I would agree, yes. Okay. Um, one easily digestible. Well, it doesn't have to be like the most succinct. It's not like literally a sentence, but overall, like what do you, okay. how do you feel the impact was? Oh, so you don't want a summary. You want me like a, like a, yeah, more like a how did you feel and what do you think the next saga could do better or what are you hoping okay. for? Sort of um thing. Okay. So it was there was a lot of growth going on mm-hmm. for the Straw Hats. We picked up two new crew members, one of which was at the very end, so I mean we're yet to see where that leads. Uh there was a single thread going through multiple arcs, which was interesting. Um because we didn't have that in East Blue. Not really, no. Uh, I mean, other than we're going to the Grand Line. <laughs> that, that was the thread. <laughs> the thread was Luffy, but he's kind of in a lot of these episodes. <laughs> what? What? Really? The main character? Mm-hmm. Um, I, okay, so I'd say the, the best parts about it were watching the characters grow. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of watching some of the hijinks they get, get into. But the Alabasta arc at the end was the best. Because you get to see... You that's when you really see like them taking their steps forward. Uh-huh. Um, like each of the main characters kinda getting stronger, um and have to overcome larger obstacles. Sure. Uh absolutely. There's also I would say the theme of the East Blue saga, which again, like you said, it didn't really have a through line. It was just kind of a collection of islands. Um, you know, it kind of, its theme was kind of the beginning, I guess, you know, and like optimism and everything's going to be okay. It was like, uh, it was about dreaming big, I think. Yeah. Right. It was all about the dreams of the, those five characters. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, obviously every time they pick up a new character, 
you learn about their dreams and that. And but there was just such a high concentration of it in the East Blue. <laughs> yes. That it it's it feels more like that it's all about the the it sets the tone for the rest of the series. Yes, I agree. But I would say that that's kind of like, you know, the prologue and the theme is kind of like the beginning of a journey, right? Mm-hmm. It sets everything up. This one you get not only do you get a narrative through line between all the different episodes, you start getting uh, villains that are are more wicked. You get a villain who puts a bomb in a giant's drink in order to take their bounty, and oh my mm-hmm. god. And you have an entire village of bounty hunters, and you have, uh, you get more wackiness. You get a whale with pipes built into its body. Oh, yeah. And and it's it, the stomach has been painted to look like a, a sky, and you're like, what the heck? You mean yeah. lopins, which are these crazy mountain body things, and a I munch, about munch those. man? Yeah. Oh my god, so... I would say that the the biggest thing about uh, season two, saga two, whatever you want to call it, is that the Straw Hats are really starting to learn how to trust one another, how to work together, and they are learning about how big the ocean can be, like how they couldn't just go up and fight Crocodile because he had these really powerful agents standing in the mm-hmm. way and he had the millions and the billions, so you really had to kind of think your way through it, and... You know, maybe future villains will also have more of that, more of the, you can't just take mm. me on. You First, you got to take out my butler, who's also able to turn into a pumpkin swordsman. Yeah. And like, it, it helps that the way they did the s- second season, it's a, it's a good kind of scale control. Mm-hmm. So you start off in the East Blue and you kind of have teases of a bigger world. But for the most part, you're in the little sandbox. Yes. And then you get to the Grand Line, which could be overwhelming, but because you have the single objective of getting to Alabasta that you get established pretty quick, mm-hmm. it helps kind of contain it, um, so it doesn't feel overwhelming, but it's bigger than the East Blue, and you also start getting more and more tidbits about like the larger world. Yes. Um, I'm curious to see if they maintain that, because at some point I feel that Either they're going to get, just knowing how long One Piece is, either they're going to have a bunch of things that don't feel like they get any bigger, hmm. uh, the arcs are just going to get super long, or it's going to get overwhelming at some point, one, somewhere in there. Like, they're going to have to either hit a ceiling mm-hmm. um, or come up with a different rhythm. They can't, you know. I am very curious uh, what you think of the next saga, although it'll be many, many episodes before we finish it up, but... Um, all aboard the hype train. We are now officially moving on to season three, the name of which I'm going to keep a secret for a little while. Uh, it's set up in such a way that you don't immediately know where it's going to go. The the uh, Alabasta arc, you pretty quickly meet Vivi, and it, it takes a little while to realize the truth about her, but eventually she goes, I need to get to Alabasta, and you go, oh, okay. Uh, this next one is going to have a bit of time before they go we need to get to location x to do thing y and so season three is coming up and all aboard the train and i'm not going to tell curtis anything woo all right uh that has been your do 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 final Final thought thought. outro goes here (laughs) see you in season three everyone I award this episode the Backstory Bug Badge. The backstory illness has gotten so rampant and infected so many characters that now it's even gone back and given us backstory for Johnny and Yosaku. Background characters we literally haven't seen in almost 100 episodes. So ends the next leg of the King of the What Now adventure. We're sad to see you go, but we'll be here next week. If you crave some social interaction with us in the meantime, you can find us on all sorts of different media. We have Gmail, Patreon, and Tumblr. All of those are King of the What Pod. King of the What Pod at gmail.com, patreon.com slash King of the What Pod, King of the What Pod dot Tumblr dot com. Our Twitter handlers are a little bit different. You can reach me at K O T W N underscore pod. And you can contact me, Curtis, at Pirate Cohost. Also, please take a moment to rate and review our podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen. Not only will this help others find the podcast, but your constructive feedback will help us improve the show as we go. Thanks so much for giving us a listen. Until next time, follow your dreams and protect your treasure. Remember, it doesn't need to be literal treasure.